Howdy, I'm Pooty. Welcome to Salmon Recon, a long play series where I record a bunch of Salmon Run shifts back to back and then add in some post commentary. Today, we'll be looking at some spicy footage from the latest Salmon Run map, the Jammin, the Salmon, the Junction. At the time of this recording, Junction was a fairly new map and had only been in rotation a few times, so if you see any players, me included, having trouble on the terrain, then please don't be too harsh on them. Everyone was still learning the ins and outs of this new stage. Anyway, now that we've agreed to be friendly cephalopods, let's dive right in and review the weapons we've got. First up, it's... It's... it's John's Splatoon. Surprise, but not really. This video is covering a wildcard weekend, aka all random weapons, every wave, every shift. So I can't really demonstrate all the weapons in the practice room without making the intro even longer than it already is. Sorry. However, I will give a brief rundown of the Grizzco Blaster, the special weapon you have a 20% chance of receiving in this rotation. The Grisco Blaster has decent damage and short range, but this weapon stands out with its super fast rate of fire. It's great at inking walls and floors, which is really handy when your team comp doesn't have a lot of inking weapons. The Grisco Blaster also excels at crowd control. You can take out crowds of lesser salmonids quite nicely due to the blast radius of your shots hitting multiple targets. You can dish out good damage on tankier enemies and boss salmonids, but only if you're in close range. When you land direct hits, you can take out boss salmonids easily, but if you aren't in range and you're only hitting a target with splash damage, it's going to take more hits, more time, and more ink. Things you may not have enough of in a busy salmon run wave. All right, we're, uh, we're finally through the intro, so we're finally off script. <laughs> we're back to the typical improv that makes up the majority of these videos. Um, I haven't recorded for Salmon Recon in a very long time, and I'm kind of realizing that by the time this video gets out, the Golden Wildcard Weekend will have already happened. So I apologize for any confusion, this gameplay is from a normal Wildcard Weekend. If you guys are interested in seeing a video that features all the Grizzco weapons, then do let me know. Funnily enough, we've started off the recording with John Splatoon, <laughs> aka the Splatter Shot. It, it is an all-rounder, which makes it really good for Salmon Run. It's got good damage, range, and fire rate, so that makes it a good anchor as well as a weapon capable of taking out pretty much every boss Salmonid. Um, it has good ink consumption too, so like you see here, you've got a weapon like the Splatter Shot and you have good ink consumption, you may want to take care of the fly fish because you're more likely to have the spare ink to throw a ink bomb compared to your allies. As far as this map's layout goes, I really love Junction so far. As you can see here, there are some <laughs> risky escape maneuvers that you can make for yourself. I do think that the draw of this stage is how it's kind of split down the center and it divides most of the map into two sides. Which means there's a lot of areas where you're surrounded by water and you risk getting either pushed in or not making jumps. And I say that as a good thing because it's fun. It's, it's fun when you manage to escape a sticky situation. Stages like Junction here have a lot of inkable walls, which means you can climb out of danger safely. There are narrow walkways and ramps, which allow you to kite and change the pathing of enemies. And while they are kind of weird, there are floor grates, which you can sink through to get out of harm's way as well. Are you fucking kidding me? As soon as I say that, my, <laughs> my fucking teammate just plummets to their death via floor grate. <laughs> just... <laughs> anyway, like I was saying... All in all, I think that when Salmon Run maps utilize your player's movement, it just makes them more fun. Sorry, I know I'm kind of talking over the game footage here, but I'll try and bring it back. We've been handed the Grizzco Blaster, which is really nice at dealing with these crowds and definitely with stingers. I also make some time to deal with that fly fish and then get out. Uh, you can see there's a big pile of golden eggs on the left, but as it stands, there's still a bunch of salmonids and bosses spawning nearby, so... Where did those eggs come from? Hello? <laughs> what? 
<laughs> but no, like, yeah, as you can see, the eggs are pretty um, guarded right now. And it's, it's kind of risky to go and start collecting them. The ones on the very far end. I'm still trying to, like, do crowd control and neutralize the enemies like the flyfish and the scrapper. But unfortunately, the flyfish missiles that were targeted on me in Saturn were a bit too much. It's just, it get, like, as you can see, it gets really, really crowded on the certain sides of the map in high tide. This fish stick, even when it doesn't have a bunch of goons, it's still a nuisance. I hate how it's blocking, <laughs> blocking a bunch of my shots. I keep seeing that more and more now. A lot of uh, steelheads seem to be taking cover behind fish sticks, which makes it a pain to shoot at their bomb. But whatever, we made it. We made it through that wave. I'm not too fussed. And for the final wave, we've got the jet squelcher. I, I actually really love using this weapon in Salmon Run. I remember hating it so much in Splatoon 2, though. <laughs> like, back then, it was really weak in Salmon Run specifically. It just had really measly damage against all of the tanky Salmonid bosses. And even though the range was nice, the rate of fire and the low damage made it just kind of miserable to use. But I'm pretty sure it's received some buffs since then. I, I, I believe it has better damage in Salmon Run Next Wave, but I don't know, I could be wrong. I decide to throw a beacon down there to my allies and let them continue to lob eggs back to the basket with the Big Shot Cannon, and then I hang back with my nice ranged weapon so that I can deposit the eggs for them. Also, like, <laughs> Sculpture is really good to use against the fish sticks. You can, as you can see, I took it out really quickly. It's actually pretty good against the steel heads too. I, if it weren't for the scrapper, I probably could have one rotationed all of those steel heads, but it turned out fine. I do think putting down a second beacon might have saved me, but also like having an ally nearby helped too. But no, like we we definitely got this wave under control with our allies sending us those eggs ahead of time. Like, sometimes the the Big Shot Basket is a red herring, and it's too dangerous to stay next to it, but if you have multiple people there and you know you have someone by the base, then it's pretty safe. It's usually just when, uh, when teammates decide to solo stay by the basket and then they, they keep getting overwhelmed by bosses that it becomes a problem but not here now our team had really nice coordination all things considered i kind of mentioned it a bit in the intro but i like the weird balance that comes with these wildcard rotations because like on one hand you're getting handed a random weapon every wave and you kind of have to adapt to it on the fly which is Kind of challenging for a lot of players who haven't played with a lot of different weapons in Salmon Run, but that challenge is kind of offset by the absurdly broken <laughs> Grisco weapons that are also sprinkled in. So, it, yeah, it kind of balances itself out. Like, just for variety's sake, I kind of wish we got these wildcard weekends more often in Salmon Run. And I'm not just saying that because I'm addicted to overclocked Grisco weapons. <laughs> I do really like wild cards. I like random weapons. Uh, we're taking a bit of a peek at the other side of this map, which isn't all that active, but I decide to ink some of the, the several walls anyway, just to give my allies and I a few more escape routes. I also plan to jump over to the other side of the map where the action is, but I carefully wait until after that steelhead bomb is detonated, and also once the enemies have been cleared off of that platform to give me a safe spot to land. It's it's a pretty easy jump to make, but you still want to be safe. You don't want to get, like, smacked into the water or, or not have enough ink floor for you to get your swim speed up and make that jump. As soon as these fish sticks start spawning in right next to our basket, I make it my sole mission to take them out. 
because believe it or not, fish sticks are actually super dangerous on maps like these. The walkways leading up to and around your basket are pretty narrow, so if you've got an enemy that just keeps using a sprinkler around you and your ally's feet, then it's going to slow down your momentum and probably lead you to get splatted by other bosses. If they aren't too close to your base, you can probably ignore them, but enemies you cannot ignore are these eels here. <laughs> the eels are probably the most dangerous boss salmonid on this map, in my opinion. Um, if you see them trying to climb their way up to your base, I would take them out well before they even get up the ramps, if possible. An enemy that can just constrict itself around your basket and block your allies between both sides of the map is not an enemy that you want to lure to your basket, honestly. That's just more reckless than anything. It looks like we're having our first night wave, and I've been handed the Luna Blaster, which is a pretty fun blaster. It's super short ranged, but also super strong. It's also a Goldie Seeking wave on High Tide, which is great for us. Um, it's, it's pretty much free, if you think about it. <laughs> There's only four gushers for the Goldie to hide in, and everywhere that the Goldie emerges from the gushers, it basically passes by our basket, so it's just gonna make very easy egg farming. Um, the locations on the far left and far right that are more surrounded by water are kind of dangerous to be in, as you can see one of our allies got knocked in, but that's just to be expected. Um, if you don't really have the range to get there, you can just lob a bomb, but really, because it's because it's high tide and there's only four gushers to be watching, it's very easy to find it. Um, I'm also just noticing that we have two blob lobbers. <laughs> that's amazing! Oh, I wish, I wish, I love Luna Blaster, okay, but I kind of wish I'd been given blob lobber. I... I love that weapon so unreasonably. It's actually my main. <laughs> I'm a blob lobber main. I'm the worst person you'll ever meet in Rainmaker. Make no mistake. <laughs> um, but I mean, yeah, you. What? 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 What can I even add to this? It's. <laughs> look how many eggs we have. It was free. I guess you may notice that I was also not focusing the goldies all that much. Our allies were doing a pretty good job of that, whereas with the blaster I mostly focus the lesser salmonids. It's a very good crowd clearing weapon, since um, it doesn't have all that much range, but it's very strong and has a pretty fast rate of fire. And for the final wave, we've been handed the Gluga Duelies. Um, hashtag Gluga Sweep. If, if you know, you know. <laughs> I decided to go ahead and pop Killer Whale here, just to deal with some of the more irritating bosses. I also start to notice that enemies are beginning to spawn from the left side of our map, whereas most of our allies are preoccupied with the right side of the map, so... While they continue to fight and gather eggs, I make my way back to our basket to try and clear a path so that no one else gets blocked out. But unfortunately, the uh, <laughs> the zoning masters, the steel eel and slime and lid start to team up and it starts to make things very dangerous. So I pop that second killer whale just to get the eel off of me because he was very clearly targeting me. Um, I start getting ideas and by ideas, I mean, you know, when you see the slam and lit and you think, I'm gonna do the funny thing that duelies do, where I jump inside the force field and then I dodge roll out of the way. No, that's, I, I was not prepared to make a duelies death. <laughs> I was not prepared to suffer that fate. So I just left. I just used my mobility to get out of there. And even though things start to get pretty close, I... it's... it's, you know, our, our allies had their specials, they took out the slam and lids in a much safer way than I would have done it. So I'm... I'm glad for that. I barely used any dodge rolls with those duelies, but 
I did manage to stay pretty mobile. Man, what the hell? Why do you get Blob Lobber again? <laughs> Why can't I get Blob Lobber? I want that. I I, I main it. It's it's in my banner. Please, Mr. Grizz. <laughs> Notice that fancy weapon you had there? That's one of my special models. How'd it feel? Uh, felt like it wasn't the blob lobber. <laughs> so kind of cringe. <laughs> cringe ass, nay nay, wage theft, Mr. Grizz, denying me my blob lobber run. I've gotta imagine that I sound like clinically insane to anyone who's not that familiar with splatted tune. Which is why I'm keeping it in the recording. The people need to know. We've been handed the heavy splatling, and it's low tide, which I'm pretty happy about. It's reassuring to have at least one ranged weapon with good DPS in your team comp going into a low tide wave, and the splatling definitely checks all of those boxes. I know a good amount of players struggle with these splatlings, whenever they're in rotation in Salmon Run, and I, I can get it. It's kind of difficult to manage your charge while being swatted at by a bunch of little guys, and also managing your ink in a mode that demands so much of it, but if you learn how to position yourself safely, then you can deal a lot of damage with these flatlings, uh, undisturbed by the little guys. I start to hear the Steelial approaching from behind, so I quickly do a 180, and glad I did because I'm pretty sure our, one of our teammates got uh, chomped by the big ol' eel. Again, on positioning, I decide to back up just to be safe. Charging and firing with the Splatling already makes your character very slow, so I didn't want, you know, Ink Storm and Wave Breaker damage on top of that. Considering how those two flyfish are lined up like right next to each other, and no one on our team was really in position to deal with them, I went ahead and popped a special just to be safe. Um, I know that it's it's wave one, and we basically had our quota, but I still wanted to play it safe. Um, playing with the splatling, you kind of naturally hang back since you're not as good in close combat as the rest of your allies, and. I guess just seeing the way that those enemies were filing in from the left, I didn't want my teammates to get pincered. Alright, I've been loaded the charger. No, loaned. Not loaded. <laughs> loaned. I, I am pretty loaded in game, though. Glad to be using yet another ranged weapon, and also a weapon that's got piercing, so it's pretty good on crowd control, too. Go ahead and take out this flyfish. Or <laughs> almost. Don't worry, homie, I got you. I, I see you. I appreciate that you threw the bomb. I, I consider taking out the stinger because it is important to get rid of, but I know that with the charger, it's gonna take a lot of ink and probably take me too long, so I leave it to my allies since they're pretty close. Go ahead and start relaying some of these eggs. And since I'm getting attacked by the scrapper, I jumped down. I didn't catch this time that I had an eel on me. I'm, I'm, so I'm glad I jumped out. That probably would have got me by surprise. Things are kind of dicey by the basket right now. It's hard to get to the slam and lid or the steelhead with the fish stick on the right. So I kind of just decide to back off and let my allies do it uh, the more barbaric way by luring down the slam and lid. And once I get an opening, I kind of sneak in and take out the other steel head, which is nice. I also do a little bit of a uh, drizzler cleanup. No, uh, no Mary Poppins allowed. Get out. <laughs> I think just really nice work um, on everyone's part. They got a lot of eggs at the end. And why, why can't I save you? Why is my aim dog shit just now? <laughs> I'm sorry, man. Ooh, we got one of the weird weapons for the final wave. Um, 
The last time I remember x Blosher being in a Salmon Run rotation, I remembered thinking, God, I should really stick with my allies if I get this weapon. Because the damage really is uh, not great. It's a technical weapon that exists to do weird inking and piercing damage, but not a lot of it. You still want to distance yourself from enemies and keep your allies close so they can do the DPS. You can do some pretty cool stuff with your range, though. I take out the slam and lid quite cleanly. I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. If you also want to do more damage with this weapon, you can if you attack an enemy against a wall, because that wall attack will do extra splash damage. But despite how many walls there are in this map, there aren't a whole lot of situations in Salmon Run generally where you are damaging Salmons and hitting the wall at the same time, because they're constantly moving towards you. Um, I remember tripping up here pretty badly. I, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought maybe I could hit the weak point of that Steel Eel, but instead I just got caught out pretty bad. I kind of struggled to ink the floor beneath me, so my movement got pretty impeded. But yeah, despite the hiccup, it was a pretty solid wave. I demonstrate some more uh, clean disposal of the slamming lids. And I didn't really get to show off the x Splosher against Flyfish, but that's fine, because right now we have an even more pressing threat. The gigantic sentient pool noodle that we gotta smack around for a bit. Shut up. Luckily, all three of my teammates wind up with really good ranged weapons for this boss. My range isn't the best, however, <laughs> but it's alright. Really, all I'm going to be doing is focusing down bosses and collecting eggs, just to keep the map from getting overwhelmed. Two of our allies are already taking out a Horoboros bomb, and it's perfect timing because by the time he comes around, we've got a bunch of eggs to chuck at him. We've already shredded his health a ton. He's amazing. <laughs> I also really like our um, unspoken coordination that our team's got going on. We've got two dudes on the left and two on the right, so that we're constantly taking out bosses and dealing damage to Horoboros whenever it circles around the map. So it's, it's working out nicely. <laughs> it's also important to try and cover for your allies the best you can. Um, I don't venture too far away from my teammates so I can revive them immediately. And noticing that the Horoboros bomb is about to detonate, I get some cheeky damage off on it by climbing up on this little ledge. Alright, so I had to replay this clip a few times just to revel in how stupid it was. I almost get my face melted off by the Horoboros bomb, and I agreed to do more damage, and then Dodge rolled the way out of Maws. Just. <laughs> Clutch and stupid and not deserved. I <laughs> gamer nation, let's go. This is this is what dually players think they look like. But yeah, not bad at all for random weapons. Out of the two king salmonids that we've got, this is definitely the one that's more fun to fight. The Kohozuna is designed more like a raid boss. Uh, I think the fact that you can lure it around is the only thing it's got going for it. Whereas the Horboros having a bomb that you have to defuse, <laughs> and also defusing that bomb rewards you with extra damage on it, is really satisfying. I'm thinking, like, for the next King Salmonid, they should just add in a guy who is really fast. Like, his deal is he just charges at players and kills them instantly. <laughs> um, maybe just make, like, just make a scrapper, but, like, a little bigger, but give him the ability to rev up and go Noom, and you can only damage him from his backside, so that it's just a constant battle of, <laughs> of luring and damaging him. We're holding on to the dark 
Tetra Dooleys from last round, which is pretty nice. We don't have a whole lot of room on the map to be using all of our dodge rolls because it is high tide, but it'll still come in handy in squeezing through tight corners. Right now, the basket is getting pretty congested and... Oh my god. God, why? Why are you doing this? <laughs> Stop! No! <laughs> you shouldn't have gotten away with that. I'm cursing my past self. Why am I doing such risky plays? There's no there's no way in, in good conscience I can recommend playing the way I did, because that was that was stupidly risky. <laughs> and now I'm paying it. I'm paying for it by doing a Mexican standoff with these two scrappers. Uh, at least my teammate is bailing me out. <laughs> like, Salmon Recon as a series isn't really meant to be showboat central. I, I save that for montages. <laughs> it's more about making important decisions on the fly and trying to coordinate with your team and also reflecting on the plays that don't go so well. It's kind of hard to criticize that play when it actually worked, so... Thanks, Pootie. I think I was so preoccupied with having the Splatana Stamper that I didn't realize it was low tide, and the rest of my team was a little slow on the uptake too, so whatever, it's fine. Also, this is a really fun set of weapons for Cannon Rush. Like, most of us are melee range, but we have the added bonus of really strong ranged cannons, so this is gonna be good. The Stamper has good damage and mobility, so you can play it kind of tanky in Salmon Run. I can confidently make my way around enemies because we have more space to move around, and I also have my allies on the cannons backing me up. I notice an unmanned cannon, so I decide to hop in it briefly and just take out some of the nearby enemies, and then assess any further threats before I start to relay eggs to the basket. I'm kind of conflicted in this moment because I realize the cannon will do better damage against these Kohawks than my primary, but I can't stay in the cannon long because there's a Maz tailing me right now. I think everybody who's played Salmon Run has had that moment where they're just vibing on a cannon and then suddenly the camera pans out to them getting eaten by Maz. Also, I gotta say, I think I was just mesmerized watching this Dynamo Roller play. Like, I definitely could have collected more eggs, but I was just like, oh, look at him go. <laughs> I'm glad the times have changed and the Dynamo is getting the respect it deserves in Salmon Run. And for the final wave, we're heading back down to low tide with the Blaster. Not, not the Grisco Blaster, just the Blaster Blaster. I'm kind of echoing the sentiment of our teammate Blaze here, who is pinging everyone this way to fall back from the shore a bit so we can lure the enemies closer to the basket. Alas, it's kind of hard to communicate that to your teammates in freelance. Regardless of how I feel, I still try and support my allies however I can by inking the floor for one teammate and then fighting the Kohawks off of another. I debate jumping over there and fighting, but worry that I might get outnumbered, so I throw a beacon instead, and thankfully it doesn't fall into the ravine. I wait until the ink storm is no longer in my path so that I can safely jump over to the other side of the map. Also, wow, I'm glad I was able to take cover from that steelhead bomb in time. That, that could have gone pretty badly. Man, for a second, for a second there, I thought that Umbrella Boy landed on top of my character and was just gonna crush them or something. Alright, that might be the easiest flyfish death I've ever suffered. 
Like, I just saw those Tenta missiles on me and turned right around and ran into them. Uh, it, it probably isn't a good thing that we have all of these ranged threats on us right now. I maybe could have been a bit more proactive with the blaster and dealt with the steelhead and the stinger, but it's a little late for that. It's fine. Our team did a good job. Thinking back to what I was talking about before, about trying to coordinate with freelancers, Blaze initially gave the voice command for us to fall back, and I followed her. But as soon as she realized that her teammates weren't going to budge, she rushed in to help support them, and so did I. That's kind of the mindset that I would recommend going into freelance. It's better to play around your allies, not so much copy what they're doing, but play in consideration of the way that they're playing. I promise you'll accomplish a lot more than just arguing this way and being stubborn with each other. <laughs> It doesn't stop being a co-op game mode just because you and your teammates have a different idea of how it should be played. Sun Tzu said that. All right, enough of that. We herald the return of the Jet Squelcher, but only briefly because this time we'll be manning the cannons for most of the wave. Watch how I wait until the scrapper is a little closer to our basket to shoot it down. If it were on one of my allies, I would probably try to neutralize it immediately, but since there wasn't any threat, I figured I could get the eggs a little closer to our base. Typically when I'm aiming my cannon shots, I don't aim directly at the target. Instead, I'm aiming at the ground or another flat surface in such a way that the target is hit by the blast radius of my shots. This is especially useful when you have an armored boss salmonid moving towards you. If you know where its weak point is, you can aim around it. Same advice goes for the slamming lids. You may want to wait until they stop moving so it's easier to aim. And it's good practice to take breaks from your cannon so that you can refill on ink and refresh your awareness of your surroundings. Enemies like maws, flipper floppers, and even scrappers and cohawks from the other side of the map might sneak up on you if the other cannon player hasn't taken them out. At this point, I was pretty low on ink and kind of worried I'd be wasting my shots trying to hit the slamming lid from behind the fish stick. So I decided to just take a break, help relay some eggs, and then manually get them down myself. I'm not really sure what that was. Maybe it was some uh, fish stick parkour. <laughs> Tuna Hawk Pro Skater 2. But yeah, we secured that wave. And now it's time for me to ink my comfort wall. For some reason, I keep ending my shifts with inking that ravine. I, I guess it's just squid stimming. Drillers. All right, nice. So. What I'm doing right here, since the griller is on me, is demonstrating how I will be luring it and affecting its pathing. The idea is to lure the grillers to the right side of your basket so that your teammates have a clear shot at their weak spots. This also gives everyone a little platform to stand on so that the small fry don't immediately swarm them. Here I'm just doing a little exhibition in case any of my teammates aren't sure how to lure the grillers. You'll also want to have at least one player on small fry duty if their weapon is best suited for it, but since two of us have really good blasters, we're basically damaging the grillers and the small fries in the same shots. At this very moment we have two grillers approaching us from both sides, so the panic specials come out. Ooh, that's rough. I believe what happened here was that I saw Griller number one was stunned, and I mistakenly thought that Griller number two would be held off by the stunned Griller number one. 
but it seems Griller number two found a way to move through its comrade. Either way, it was dangerous for me to be down on the floor like that. And in a few seconds, it's gonna happen again. <laughs> I'm not really gonna make an excuse for my mistake when it could have been avoided entirely. Should any of your teammates get knocked out, the most important thing you can do is prioritize staying alive and then stun any nearby grillers so that they don't keep knocking out your teammates one by one. I don't need to reintroduce the OG blaster, we know it slaps. The foggy night wave. Visibility is extremely low and it's extremely dangerous not knowing what bosses are on the map and where. I don't want our team to fall behind early, so I use my last ink strike to knock out the fly fish that's out of the way, and also get rid of that slamming lid so once I go further down the map, I'm not getting intercepted by all the boys who keep spawning out of it. Just quickly inked and climbed a wall so that I could mess with the pathing of an enemy that I wanted to avoid fighting right away. Even though it's hard to take my surroundings in with all the fog, I try and assess what is the most dangerous right now, and where my teammates are. I don't want the eel creeping up on our basket, so I target him first. In special fog waves, it's good to hit your quota early, just in case things get out of hand near the end. You may get lucky with Goldies or even Snatchers bringing eggs to your basket, but it isn't guaranteed they'll bring you a lot. If you've got to resource eggs from elsewhere, then do it early. Man. Fortunately, our teammates did a good job of taking care of the stingers and flyfish this round. But if nobody is taking it upon themselves to get rid of the stationary bosses, you may have to be the one to go seek them out. Fortunately, with stingers and flyfish, you do have an indication of where their shots are being fired from. Just, <laughs> just be mindful making your way through the fog so you don't get ambushed by any enemies. Anyways, I would like to send a shout out to Lifelong Dog, Silent Legend, and Drained Material. What are you? We've really come a far way from putting titles like S head in our profile banners. Seems like most of the player names and titles that I see now are like really weird, abstract nonsense. It strikes me as very Zoomer. Ah, yes. Booyah. I agree with you 100%. Splatoon user tax fraud. Oh man, we got the Clash Blaster. <laughs> Look, I'll keep saying it. Using the original blaster in Salmon Run, even when the Grisco Blaster is in rotation, still goaded. It's got better range than the Grisco Blaster, it's got higher damage per shot. Both of them have their pros and cons, and both of them have things they do better than the other, but both are still really, really good to use. But Clash Blaster... <laughs> Clash Blaster right next to Grisco Blaster it feels so weak. It feels so underwhelming. I can still make it work. Like, Clash Blaster is still good in Salmon Run, it's just... And I wish I was shooting like 70 pew pew blasts per second. I'm sorry, I gotta apologize. I'm getting to a point in recording where I'm honestly feeling pretty lethargic. I know this episode is gonna be longer than the others, and it's got me covering a whole lot of different stuff. And it's making me kind of torn between do I include all of the gameplay? Do I just cut it short? All right, excellent work, tax fraud. Just, um, pretend that the Steel Eel is the IRS. Maybe it's just me, but it feels ingenuine. I don't want to be cherry-picking the footage where I played well, and then omitting the clips where I played poorly. I still wanted to end the episode on a high note, which is typically fighting another King Salmonid. I still feel like all of the footage was worth sharing, and... 
Since I took such a long break from this channel, it feels like I should return strong. So I'll try to be strong for Mr. Grizz. Alright, interesting. We're getting some more um, night wave variations, which I'm glad I got to showcase. It's really rare to see us fail one of these waves. Like, nowadays, it's a challenge to make me mad at Salmon Run. Like, legitimately mad. But the last time that I was on a team that failed Mudmouth, I was like, ooh. <laughs> How can you even fail that wave? Don't tell me you suck at Ink Storm. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose the easiest Mudmouth wave to fail would be one on Normal Tide, just because of the distance and traveling and sending eggs. But that's definitely not an issue on this map. There are so many locations where you can toss an ink bomb from a distance into a mud mouth and be completely safe. Like from these grates to the middle platform or on this left scaffolding. Oh yeah, we have a weapon, but it doesn't play a huge role because we don't have the best crowd control with it. The Snipe Rider. I'm getting a little nostalgic. This was the charger we used in the first recon video. In Salmon Run, I definitely prefer the chargers that apply piercing to their fully charged shots. That piercing shot is probably the most overlooked feature of chargers in Salmon Run. A lot of players, when they're handed a charger, they think their only mission is to take out bosses. But what they may not realize is that their charger might be the best crowd control weapon in their entire team. But yeah, the Snipe Rider can do some decent damage to the Kohawks in terms of holding them off during a Mudmouth wave. But a Charger with Piercing would make dealing with these bozos just trivial. At least I got Splat Bombs. Everybody's got Splat Bombs. Oh, okay. The new Blaster, the S-Blast. Pretty interesting pick. Also considering that we're doing the Goldie Seeking in Normal Tide. Don't know that I really need to explain this wave to you guys. It's basically just a find the Goldie, you're getting hotter, you're getting colder kind of deal. You basically tear open a gusher and check out the water height and the glowing. The more it glows and the higher the spout of water, then the closer you are to finding the Goldie. This is just one of those challenge waves where your success rate is going to be based on your team's collective understanding of each stage's layout. Knowing things like the gusher locations and the pathing that the Goldie will run in will help you a lot. You'll also want to properly use voice commands in-game to signal where the Goldie is popping out. Because more often than not, the reason people lose these normal tide Goldie seeking waves is because their teams failed to mobilize and collectively do enough damage to the Goldie at a fair distance from the basket. As far as difficulty in terms of stage layout goes, my point about Junction still stands. There are a lot of creative ways to get around this map. So as long as you keep your allies posted on where the Goldie is headed, you should be able to get enough eggs and deliver them fairly easily. Anyway, still feels free. It was a weird gimmick wave, so I didn't have a whole lot to share about the S-Blast, but I like it a lot. It almost feels like the E-Leader of Blasters. I don't know if that's just because of the range and the strength, but I can dig it. I gotta say though, I'm really struggling to get used to mobility with the S-Blast. Like, the way that most blaster players move around is they shoot a line of ink, and then they quickly swim through it, and then they hop up in the air and they shoot again, and repeat ad infinitum. But the gimmick with the S-Blast is if you jump and shoot with it, your range shortens. So it's, like, very contrarian to the way that blaster players usually move around. Oh, that, that is to say, it's still possible to do the jump movement with S-Blast, it's just kind of trickier to time it. You have to shoot right before you jump in order to get that long shot. 
It's it's just yeah, the timing's just weird and awkward after using blasters for so long. What am I, Splatana? I'm not paying attention. Splatana does feel pretty good to play in really cramped um, situations like High Tide because you've got that really nice close range damage and also mobility to help you squeeze through tight spots. Okay, I was gonna say, like, <laughs> I was gonna be really annoyed if my teammate was pinging me this way when I'm the only one dealing with the fly fish on high tide, but no, it seems they were they were talking about the fly fish. And speaking of, you take one down and another shows up in its place. Uh, salmon run, baby! Lately, the Splatana's kind of been my, um, my pocket gremlin scrimblo pick. Alright, god, how do I even begin to explain this? So, <laughs> so, the pocket gremlin scrimblo pick is a silly weapon that you kind of just play to have fun and unwind. And for me lately, that's what the Splatana is. Because sometimes you're just, you're throwing a bunch in rank or you're trying to learn a new weapon in Turf War and struggling. And the little devil sitting on your shoulder is like, play the Slayer weapon, get a bunch of kills and die a lot, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Other notable mentions for this kind of weapon are like the sploosh matic and a lot of the rollers, honestly. And I think it's, it's pretty telling that these gremlin weapons for me are, like, high damage, close range weapons. Because the actual role that I'm trying to learn is backliner. So, you you have to- it's like yin and yang. You- you have to even it out. <laughs> you- you just- you gotta. I am adding, like, no meaningful commentary to the footage at hand. You know, this happened last video, too. Oh yeah, yeah, I've got something for you guys. So last video, I shared with you guys the really weird dream I had about a Super Mario Sunshine mod. And now I've got another dream I want to tell y'all about, which is actually relevant because it was a Splatoon dream. Alright, so for, for context, we all know that there's a lot of NPCs in Splatoon. And when it comes to localization, there are minor changes that happen to them, whether that's their name or bits about their personality or how they talk. But in, in the dream that I had, in the dream, not in the real world, I learned that the members of Deep Cut had different designs in the original Japanese version of Splatoon 3 compared to the rest of the world, which got the deep cut that we know now. But these were these were visual designs, like different character models and everything. Um, <laughs> and it's just killing me thinking about this. Okay, so compared to the other two, Shiver had the least amount of changes. She looked like almost identical, uh, just a little bit off. And her name was Kaori for some reason. Um, but she she mostly looked and acted this exactly the same. Fry had some clothing changes, um, but most notably her personality was quite different. For some reason they were leaning into like a cutesy and innocent look for her. Like, they made her smaller, her eyes were very big, and she usually looked, like, surprised. And it's funny because I know that for the original Japanese dialogue for Fry, she actually speaks very old-fashioned, and she sometimes kind of sounds like a grandma. So, <laughs> this, this was a pretty weird take for her. I, I can't remember what her name was in the dream. But the biggest change of all was the biggest band member, which is Big Man. And for some reason, instead of being a Manta Ray, he was instead replaced with a really buff Inkling girl? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try and draw what she looked like in the dream, but she basically was just an Inkling girl that was buff with, like, a very gray color motif 
like Big Man has, and a headband with some red accents. Uh, her personality was very different. She was very focused on, like, strength training to the point where, like, the other two band members would point it out and be like, whoa, that's, cra that's crazy. But, but what absolutely kills me about this is that is that she was still called Big Man. <laughs> no, like, and, and she's very clearly a girl. She's very clearly depicted as a girl, and everyone's using she, her pronouns for her, but, but her name is Big Man. And I guess that's just how it is in Splatlandia. I was thinking about this dream a lot when I was making breakfast this morning. I was just thinking, like, on one hand, it'd be really sad if they changed Deep Cut in any way. But on the other hand, um, an inkling girl named Big Man is, like, the most gender character to not exist in Splatoon. And honestly, I, I kind of envy her. <laughs> wow, I'm really losing steam. Uh... The footage is pre-recorded. Maybe you just want to vibe with me for a bit. Uh, maybe you just want to watch some Salmon Run footage with no commentary. Just for a little bit. As a treat.
Well, that was unfortunate. I can think of a few ways that I could have played that better. As important as it is to clear lesser salmonids, the Rapid Blaster Pro is definitely not that great of a weapon for it. I should have been more proactive in dealing with the ranged stationary bosses like my teammates were. And while I didn't really have a good special for dealing with fly fish, I at least could have used the reef slider to deal with some of the bosses rather than just using it as an escape. It was unfortunate and definitely misplayed, but it's fine because we learn from things like this. Alright, uh, thanks for bearing with me. I'm gonna ease my way back into actual commentary now. We've been handed the Carbon Roller, which unfortunately isn't one of the better rollers to use for Goldie Seeking Wave. Right now I'm kind of demonstrating what a roller would typically do during a Goldie Seeking Wave, but it doesn't work quite that well with Carbon. Carbon's base damage has been buffed in Salmon Run, but its roller damage is only enough to one-shot Small Fry and the chums that you fight in Glowfly Rush, since those guys have reduced health. All the other enemies you kind of just bounce off of, and I've seen so many players get ricocheted into the water that way. Since it's, <laughs> since it's pretty much the smallest and most lightweight roller, it kind of struggles to catch the Goldie. So really the best way you can use this weapon is just pretend like you're playing whack-a-mole and just keep swinging and swinging and swinging it. And this is just general advice for weapons that don't have the best damage or range, but use your splat bombs. You've always got those. Oh, um, kind of related, uh, speaking about pincering the Goldie, I just learned that you can trap the Goldie with a Wave Breaker. I don't do it in this play session because it's Wave 1 and we don't need the Wave Breaker, but in a different play session, on this exact stage, I accidentally managed to trap the Goldie between, like, the basket and my Wave Breaker. And there's probably some weird collision going on with this thing and the pathing of the Goldie. Because, like, if it were a player or a different Salmonid, with all the damage they're taking, they'd probably get splatted before you even realize it. But because it's a Goldie and the Goldie has so much health, we actually get to see it happen in this clip. So, yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's people who've discovered this before, but this is news to me. It's, it's just kind of cool that it happened. I didn't even, I didn't even mean to do it. <laughs> Two chargers and high tide. Yeah, I kind of like this comp. We all have a lot of range at our disposal. Oh, and just lovely, beautiful, kissable teammates dealing with fly fish. <laughs> I reacted pretty, uh last second to that steelhead there. I've been getting a lot better with my, uh, I'd say, reaction time with chargers. Not not just in Salmon Run, but in, in PvP too. Notice how I'm doing more than just standing around and aiming to snipe out bosses. I'm doing things like inking, I'm dealing with fly fish, I try to do crowd control, you, you gotta be pretty versatile in Salmon Run when it comes to chargers. Because there's a lot more that has to be done in the immediate. When things clear up enough that you can reliably hit the weak points of bosses, then you go into sniper mode. POV, you're a deer on the road at 3am. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that was the other charger who got the steelhead, not me. God, why do I love dangerous situations so much? Just getting out of this by the skin of my teeth. Ugh. Fortunately, the bosses stop spawning in at like the 28 second mark, so we at least have a brief moment of peace where we can tidy things up a bit and cram the rest of the eggs into the basket. Anyway, cool beans. My teammates are so booyah. It turns out they might be the only real ones. Nice. A night wave with a super strong weapon, the 96 gal. This thing is such a beefy shooter. And it's mud mouths, whatever. Free as fuck. Everyone threw their bomb 
at like the same time. They know what it is. I don't have any specials, but I'm pretty sure we don't need them. Our teammates have some specials stored up. We may as well just, you know, just go all out. Mudmouth is just so chill on this map. You can just hang out in the center platform and aim your bombs over the lesser salmonids. Even the Munmouths on the far ends aren't that hard to deal with, you just have to cooperate with your allies. Or just let your allies wail on them with specials, that works too. Oh, nice. So satisfying. You know, they really thought that, like, story mode in Splatoon 3 and Little Buddy would make everybody like small fry more? Nah, nah, fuck them. Kill them on sight. I, I don't like small fry, but I love murdering them. Just, <laughs> just my teammates are pushing the objective, and I'm just, I'm just over here playing with small fry for the hell of it. I guess in a way I'm helping, but if I'm being perfectly honest, I'm just doing this for my own benefit. And as I always say in this series, being honest and open with yourself is the key to wow, that's a lot of fucking eggs. What was I saying? Ew. Honest to god, I don't remember how this wave went. Tell me I got a funny weapon. Dapples? Ayo? Yes, please. Oh, baby. The range on these isn't the best, but it is also kind of the weapon that has some of the best DPS in the game when you do your dodge roll. So, like, yes, please. I am still trying to play a little bit safe. Because dappled deaths and dually deaths are embarrassing. And I'm kind of just... I don't know, this just feels like a, um, celebratory lap. I'm kind of just, like, trying to keep my allies alive so that they can participate in the funny extra wave boss fight, too. Because it's thanks to them that I got here, and... I hate sitting around in a life raft when there's a big boss to fight. Even if I know my allies are gonna kill it, I kind of, you know, I want to participate. He's dead. He's so dead. <laughs> he can't- <laughs> I like how I'm just down in that little ledge and he can't even reach me. Oh, that's wonderful. The buddies. Let's go, boys. Roll out. Wow, that's- that's actually a pretty good scale distribution. Yeah, six silver scales isn't bad at all. But seriously, some really fun waves. I'm honestly really happy to be giving this series a shot again. I don't believe that the next episodes will run as long as this one did, but <laughs> I hope that this kind of makes up for me taking such a long break. Thank you so much for making it to the end. If there's anything y'all have in mind that you'd like to see featured in the next episode, whether it's a certain map in Salmon Run, or maybe a specific weapon, or even special occasions like the Golden Weekend or Big Run, let me know. As always, drink plenty of water, be good to yourselves, be good to your buddies, booyah them back, and the haters were trembling, the haters were seething, they didn't want to believe that Salmon and Smokeyard was coming back, but it's back, baby! It's so back! We are so back! Smokeyard sweep! Smokeyard sweep! <laughs>